Good evening, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed the message that Brother Rod brought this morning. It's good to see you here for a time of studying our Sunday school lesson. Have you ever had a time in your life where you really and truly felt excluded? I like to think back on the time when I was in school and, you know, you always had that time where you go to PE and maybe you were picking teams for dodgeball or kickball or something like that. And everybody had to line up on the wall. And then you'd see every person be picked one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. I can honestly say that I don't recall a time that I was ever the last person to be picked, but I always felt bad for the last person to be picked because I knew that they had to be experiencing some feelings of exclusion or that they weren't good enough or that they weren't a part of the group or whatever the case may be. They're the last one to be picked. And so they're wondering who are they going to be you know, playing with and does anybody really want them on their team? Well, today's Sunday School lesson focuses on how no one is excluded from the opportunity to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ, that God makes salvation possible for everyone, that God's mercy extends to everyone who would receive His free gift of salvation. Now, in Romans chapter 9, verse 10, uh, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11, there's a little bit of a focus on what God is doing in the life of the Jewish people. And the Apostle Paul deals with the idea that, okay, if the Jews have not believed that Jesus is the Messiah, has God sort of wrote them off and said He's done with them? And he answers that question and says, absolutely, that is not the case. Paul believed that God was not finished with the Jews. And we're going to see in our text today that if they'll repent and they'll come to faith in Christ, they too can also be saved. Now I have before me here just a little branch from a tree outside here at the church because one of the illustrations that the Apostle Paul is going to use in our verses today deals with grafting. I know certain individuals in our church know a lot about grafting. Maybe Don Britt, maybe Gary Wiley, some of the people who've done a lot of farming or gardening. A lot of you people know a lot about grafting. And one thing that he does is he sort of reverses the process of grafting in these verses. Normally what they would do is they would cultivate an olive tree, and then they would take a cultivated branch from the olive tree, and they would graft it to a wild olive tree. The wild tree would have a, a stronger root system and a sturdier uh, trunk and everything, and so grafting in the cultivated branch, which yields a better fruit, it would be on a bigger, stronger plant, and so they would have a better increase from that. Now, Paul sort of changes that a little bit in his illustration, and I really, truly, personally believe that the reason he changes that is so that it fits in with what he's actually trying to illustrate. But in the hearts and minds of the original readers, and even for us today, we can get the point, as the Spirit leads and guides us, that you know what? Every person that's a part of God's family is there because they're placed there, and they're allowed there because of faith and that no person can't be grafted in if they just have faith. Whether they be a Jew or a Gentile, doesn't matter, that all are part of, of God's family because of faith. And so let's read today and dive right in. Let's look at Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. It says this, Now if some of the branches were broken off, and you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them, and have come to share in the rich root of the cultivated olive tree, do not boast that you're better than those branches. But if you do boast, you do not sustain the root, but the root sustains you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, they were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but beware. Because if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either." What a great illustration we have here when we're looking at how Paul is explaining that the Gentiles have been grafted in to the rich root. Now, let's look and see these different parts, you know, what they truly represent. When he's talking about the broken off branches in this passage, who do you think he's talking about? That's right, the Jews. And when he's talking about the wild olive branches that are being grafted in, who do you think that Paul is referring to with the illustration there? That's right, the Gentiles. And then finally, he's talking about them being grafted into the rich root. That definitely represents 
God. And so I like to think of it as he's using this illustration in order to talk about how people are grafted in to become a part of the family of God. Why was it so important that Paul would remind the Gentiles not to be boasting about their salvation? I really think that he wanted to keep them from being prideful. He wanted them to remain and stay humble. And so in reminding them to stay humble, he's telling them, look, your salvation is not about anything that you bring to the table. You have no merit that awards you salvation. Instead, it's completely and totally a gift of God. Our Sunday school lesson through and through is focused on mercy, that God has decided to have mercy on the Gentiles. They're not deserving of salvation, neither were the Jews. But every person that has salvation has been freely given it, and it is a merciful act of God to include them and to bless them and make them a part of His family. And so as he's reminding them of that, it should cause believers to have, you know, gratitude, to be thankful. If we'll stay humble and remember that salvation is completely and totally of God, it'll remind us to stay thankful to God that he has gifted us with salvation that we can only have through faith in Christ, and it will cause us to live differently. Our lives, our sanctifications really uh, stems out of our uh, you know, God changing our life and changing our desires and making us thankful for what He's done for us. We become aware of what God's done, and then it changes the way that we live and the way we walk. It'll change the way that we speak to others. It'll change the way that we treat others. It'll change everything in our lives, and it starts that change from the inside, and then it has an outward effect, and it puts on display that God has done something different in our lives. One thing that he points out is that he doesn't want them to be prideful. He doesn't want them to be boasting. He wants them to be humble so that they don't forget that they're you know, part of the family of God because God has been merciful. It would be so easy for them to think, you know what? I'm right with God. I'm better than these Jews that have rejected Jesus. But you know, for every Christian, that's a great reminder for us today. We cannot be boastful that, you know, in God's eyes we're saved or anything like that because it's nothing that we've done, nothing that we've contributed, nothing that we've brought to the table that has affected that change in the reality of our eternity. Instead, God has done all of it, and so we don't have any room to brag. We have no room to look down on others. Instead, what we ought to do is we ought to think, you know what? God was merciful to me that before I knew Him, He loved me. Before I ever even knew Him, could love Him. He loved me and sent His Son to die for me. It reminds us to stay on an equal playing field and to stay at the same level with other people who are unbelievers today. If we encounter Jewish people that don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, we can't look down on them. No, instead, we need to stay humble about our salvation, that it's a free gift of God, that God has been gracious and merciful to us. And we should never be prideful about our status as being grafted in as part of the rich root of God. Instead, we need to continue to evangelize and continue to share and be thankful that God has changed our lives. So thankful, in fact, that we want other people to experience that same change as well. Have you ever seen a, a balancing scale? Maybe one that looks like this. Let me tell you a little bit about how balancing scales work. Typically, they would take something of an unknown weight and put it on one side, and then they would, to the other side, continue to add uh, you know, weights that they knew, you know, this is how many pounds or how many ounces or whatever it is, until eventually that scale leveled out because it was centered perfectly. Then they would know the exact weight or exact amount of whatever it is that they're scaling or, or weighing out. In our next passage, we're going to see that God has two different attributes that weigh out perfectly. Look and read with me in Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 22. It says this, Therefore, consider God's kindness and severity, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you, if you remain in His kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not remain in unbelief, will be grafted in, because God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree, and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. So then what are the two different attributes of God that are weighed in the balance here? One of them is kindness. The other one is severity. Now let's think about it from a logical perspective. 
God is not so kind that He overlooks the evil that people do. God has to judge sin and our wrongdoings. But God's not so harsh or so severe that He condemns anyone without cause. And so He's perfectly balanced. We could say that God is just. And so the balancing is a great way to illustrate that God has this in one hand and this in the other, and they both work together. And we can see how that works together in our lives. God's not so harsh that He would just condemn people without cause. We know that God has the right to condemn everyone because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a just man upon the earth that does good and does not sin. We know the Scriptures teach us that and that under the law we're, we all stand condemned. But God's so kind, okay? He's so rich in mercy that He decided to make a way for us as unbelievers to be reconciled to Himself, and that's through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If we just have faith in Christ as a sacrificial atonement for our sins, we can be saved and reconciled to Him. You see, it's always been the case that faith was required for salvation. No one was ever saved by their own merit or by perfectly keeping the law or anything like that. Even in the Old Testament, the, the followers of God, they, they always had to give a sacrifice. And by faith, they believed that that substitutionary atonement, that it, uh, you know, it made them right with God. It was really always looking forward to Jesus as being the one true and real, you know, lasting uh, sacrifice for all of our sins. And so God is perfectly kind and perfectly severe. He, he always gives the right punishment. So how can, uh, how can God be perfectly you know, kind and severe? How can He be perfectly just? Let's think for a moment. If How can He be perfectly just if we are sinners but we don't get punished? Here's the thing. God still exacts His wrath because of our sin. It's just that Jesus absorbed that penalty. So we have reason to be thankful that God is just and that there is a penalty and it is paid. But Jesus Christ was the one that stood in our place, that died for us on the cross. The cross He took that day was for you, it was for me, it was for all who would believe, for both Jew and for Gentile. And in fact, He goes on to talk about grafting in and, and, and uh, you know falling away and then being grafted back and things like that. What is He talking about? He's talking about the people of God, that the, the Jews were known as the people of God. But if they don't have faith in Jesus as Messiah, then they're not part of the rich root, which is God. They're not part of God's family. Instead, the Gentiles have an opportunity to be grafted in. And he talks about how he's, he's sharing with us how they're being grafted in, the Gentiles being grafted in, will make the Jewish people jealous of that relationship, that close relationship with God, and will cause them to want to have faith in Jesus as Messiah and to want to be reconciled to God. So what happens? Are they too far gone? No, absolutely not, Paul's trying to say, especially as he says in, in chapter 11, verse 1, I ask then, has God rejected His people? Absolutely not. God has not rejected them. He's waiting for them to have faith in Him. And many of the Jews will be saved because they'll have faith in Christ Jesus. They're not going to be saved because ethnically or anything like that, they're Jews. They'll be saved the same way that anyone's saved, by faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So no one has the opportunity to be prideful. We all have to be thankful for God's perfect mercy, God's perfect mercy that He's poured out upon you and upon me. And so he's saying and uses the illustration, if this branch that has never belonged to this tree, if this wild branch can be grafted into the cultivated tree, well then how much easier would it be to take a cultivated branch and put it back to a cultivated tree? And so that illustration that he's using is a great reminder for them and for us today that anyone who has faith can be part of this rich root, can be part of the family of God. In fact, if you today will place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you can be saved. Let's look and see what he says beginning in verse 25. I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you will not be conceited. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage. But regarding election, they are loved because of the patriarchs, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. 
And so we're reminded that God's plan for salvation has always been based on faith. God's the one that has all authority, and He's able to graft anyone in to the rich root, to being a part of His family, any person that expresses faith in Him. He's done it for the Gentiles, and He'll do it even for the Jews if they'll come to faith in Christ. And so he illustrates that with this, uh, you know, this grafting in and grafting out and explaining all of that. And so we're able to see exactly what he's doing and how it's all a work of God. When God's the one that does all the work in salvation, it clearly shows that he is the only one that's deserving of glory for having done that. And so God gets all the credit for my salvation. If you're saved for your salvation, if someone else is saved for their salvation, and it eliminates any opportunity for us to be prideful, and every reason is given to us to be thankful. But He also wants for us to be aware that, hey, salvation is something that is totally a work of God, and God is still at work in the hearts and lives of people all around us, Jews and Gentiles. I like what he points out about how there's a partial hardening that's come upon, you know, typically the, the, the hearts of the people of Israel. Why? Because God is still working in and amongst them. We have to be dedicated to share the gospel with people who tell us that they're Jews, but that they don't believe in Jesus, to share with them that we know that the Messiah has come. And we need to be bold in our witness and in taking the gospel everywhere, including to places where people say they follow God, but that they don't believe in the Messiah. Let's look and see what it says beginning in verse 30. It tells us this, As you once disobeyed God, but now have received mercy through their disobedience, so they too have now disobeyed, resulting in mercy to you, so that they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that He may have mercy on all. Do you see the emphasis here on mercy, that God has been merciful? There's no room for us to, to boast or to be prideful. Instead, we should be humble because God's the one that has decided to have mercy on us. Our, our a lesson book this week gives a, a definition, an explanation of the term election. Let me read it to you. Election is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness and is infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. So how does this help us to realize that, that God is the one that affects the change in our life when we receive salvation? We're reminded that it's totally a work of God, that it, we are so dependent upon His mercy. How many times in those last few verses did the word mercy come up? Let's look and see how many times in those last few verses it says the word mercy. As you once disobeyed God, but now have received mercy through their disobedience, so they too have now disobeyed, resulting in mercy to you, so that they also may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that He may have mercy on all. Four different times it says the word mercy. And when we look at that, we see that God is offering His justice, but at the same time He's maintaining you know, this idea uh, of mercy. And so he's got this perfect balance of kindness and severity. God exacted all the severe punishment for our sin on Jesus Christ. None of us have any merit or any claim to salvation or right standing or righteousness or any kind of holiness you know, with God. Instead, we're completely and totally dependent upon him. And we need to be aware that whoever God wants to save, he can save. If these people, these Jews, these people of Israel have not believed in the Messiah... And so God says they're not part of His family, but then later they have faith and God wants them to be part of the family. Then He can do that. He's God. He has all power. He has all authority. And we need to be aware of the fact that because of our relationship with God, God might be working in the life of someone else, whether they're a Jew or whether it's a fellow Gentile. People will see your life and they'll see that there's something different about you. And you need to know that God is still at work through you and around you in the lives of other people. And so just some simple reminders to us today. Um, God is merciful to everyone and gives salvation to everyone who places their faith in His Son. So I just want to ask you a simple question. How does an awareness that God will save all people change the way we live our daily lives? How does it change the kind of conversations or maybe the boldness we have in evangelistic conversations, knowing that, you know what, God wants to save all people. He wants to have mercy on everyone. 
one of the neat things from our lesson is that God doesn't change. You know, he, what He gifts and what He does is irrevocable, can't be changed, doesn't, it? it's not taken back, there's no regret. And so the same God that saved Paul is the same God that saves me, that saves you, and possibly the person that you share the gospel with this week. So I want to give you an encouragement. As you have received mercy, be humble about it, be thankful, but be aware that other people need to hear the good news and be bold enough to witness and share. And don't worry, am I going to do a great job or you know, am I going to cause that person to be... It's always the work of the Holy Spirit. You're just the vessel. You're just the tool. God works through your salvation to affect it into other people as well. Guys, I just want to encourage you. I love you guys. Can't wait to see you in person in the near future. Keep staying in your Sunday school lessons. Look at the books. If you'll take these Sunday school lessons and you'll study them and you'll keep these books, you'll basically have a commentary on all the different lessons that we've done at your disposal so that you can lead others or so you could go back and refer to it some other time. Could we just go to the Lord in a word of prayer? Father, thank you so much for the lesson we have this week. Thank you, God. It's such an encouragement to know that you want to show mercy to all people. Help us never to be conceited or boastful about the salvation that you've offered to us, but instead to be so thankful that we want to go out and share with the world. God, we want you to be glorified. You alone are worthy of the glory of all the nations. And so, Lord, we just give our lives to you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.